But this morning, as Barry said, we are looking at the life of Hezekiah. I understand you're going through the, the kings, then we get to Hezekiah this morning. What I didn't realise is behind David and then Solomon, Hezekiah has the most amount of scripture devoted to him. I did not realise that when I started, um, but there's something like 11 or 12 chapters worth of scripture. We're not going to read all that this morning, but before we do, how about uh, let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who made a way through the cross at Calvary as we just sung. Lord, we thank you for uh, your word that you've given us, that we can uh, open it and read it and that we can understand more of who you are. And so, Lord, this morning we ask that your spirit may speak to each one of us, that it may, that the spirit may open your word to um, our hearts and that we may be encouraged or challenged wherever we may need to be, Father, that we may walk away from here rejoicing and, and being closer uh, to you, Father. So we thank you once again for bringing us here this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you have your Bibles with you, if you would like to open to 2 Chronicles chapter 29, that's where we're going to start this morning. The other references we'll look at are in 2 Kings and, and Isaiah, as you can see up there, we'll flip as we go through. But before we go, let's remind ourselves of where we are, because I think it's been a few weeks. I'll just turn this on. I think it's been a few weeks. Uh, is it on? Anyway. There we go. I think it's been a few weeks before since you've last had a look at the kings. And so the last king before Hezekiah was his father Ahaz. Now this is just a, sorry about the quality, it was just a, a uh, picture I'd taken probably 10 years ago. Um, this was the terrible king Ahaz. He had done evil in the sight of the Lord, he'd shut the doors of the temple and set up pagan worship. He'd also um, brought Judah into Assyrian vassalage or into bondage to Assyria. Now Ahaz has died and now Hezekiah has risen to power. Hezekiah was king number 13 out of the 19 kings and the one queen that ruled the southern kingdom known as Judah. It was Hezekiah now who steered a course of independence from the Assyrians. He was the second last good king, as you'll see up there, with only Josiah to come who would bring honour and glorify God. So let's read, let's start by reading uh, Hezek uh, Hezekiah 2 Chronicles chapter 29 verses 1 to 2. And it says this, Hezekiah became king when he was 25 years old and reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father David had done. Now, as I was researching this morning, I had great difficulty in trying to put together a timeline of his life so that we can have a look at it and, just, and, have a, and see what we can speaks to us this morning and it's much disputed among scholars um, as to when his reign began and when it ended. There are various biblical statements that could permit a date as early as 729 BC or as late as uh, 715 BC as I have up there and after researching I've settled on the 715 BC but it's just to give a bit of a timeline this morning and understand that there may be differing positions on this but um, let's just keep reading. In verse 3 of 20, chapter 29, it says this, In the first year of his reign, in the first month, he opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. Then he brought in the priests and the Levites and gathered them in the east square. And he, and he said to them, Hear me, Levites, now sanctify yourselves, sanctify the house of the Lord, sanctify the house of the Lord God of your fathers and carry out the rubbish from the holy place. The temple had been closed by King Ahaz, as I mentioned. And the first thing 25-year-old Hezekiah does is he opens the doors of the house of the Lord. Then he brought in the priests and the Levites and he said, sanctify yourselves, and once you've done that, sanctify the temple. And all this took 16 days. They completed all that Hezekiah had asked in 16 days. So you find that in another reference. There was no messing around with Hezekiah. Hezekiah had it purposed in his heart, it was his aim to please and worship the God. And that was the first thing, some of the first reform he did when he came king. In 2 Chronicles 29, if we flip over, dip, move down to verses 27 to 29, so he's consecrated, he's consecrated, he's sanctified the house of the Lord, he's opened the doors, 
and he decides this is time to worship. So, he, so in verse 27 he says this, Then Hezekiah commanded them to offer the burnt offerings on the altar. And when the burnt offering began, the song of the Lord also began, with the trumpets and with the instruments of David, king of Israel. So all the assembly worshipped the singers, all the assembly worshipped. The singers sang and the trumpeters sounded. All this continued until the burnt offering was finished. And when they had finished offering, the king and all, all, all who were present with him bowed and worshipped. Hezekiah restored temple worship. That's one of his major reforms that when people talk about Hezekiah, he restored temple worship. And he did this all within the first month of his reign. He was zealous for the Lord and he had his priorities right. In his second month, Hezekiah desires to keep the Passover and he sends messages all throughout the southern kingdom and also to those in the northern kingdom, those who had escaped the hand of the kings of Assyria. And he asked them to come celebrate the Passover in Jerusalem. And in 2 Chronicles 30, verses 10 to 11, we read this. He said, So the runners passed from city to city through the country of Ephraim, Manasseh, and as far as Zebulun. And they laughed at them and mocked them. Nevertheless, some from Asher, Manasseh, and Zebulun humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem. He was mocked by some of these northern kingdom tribes. But that did not stop Hezekiah from pleasing God and the Passover was celebrated. In fact, they actually kept it, Scripture records, they kept it for another seven days as the joy was that great as it hadn't been celebrated since the time of King Solomon. On that national level, that is. Hezekiah achieved some unity, I guess you could call it, for the first time in over 200 years between the northern and southern tribes. And as a result of this renewed focus on God, we read the following in 2 Kings. So if you'd like to flip, flip across to 2 Kings, because the rest of our readings will be from 2 Kings today. In 2 Kings, chapter 18, uh, verses 4 to 6, he says this. He removed the high places and broke the sacred pillars. He cut down the wooden images and broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the children of Israel burned incense to it and called it Nehushtan. He trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings, nor who were before him. For he held fast to the Lord, he did not depart from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses. Hezekiah's life, especially this first bit that we see in Scripture, and it's all of his life, but this first bit of Scripture really uh, d details, is characterised by a trust and a zeal, a real zeal for the Lord. Zeal means he was passionate or enthusiastic, he had a fire burning within himself to do the things of the Lord, those things that pleased him. He was, I guess you could say, he was sold out for God. His aim was to lead the country to follow God. And remember, this is the bit that got me, remember, he was a young man, only 25 years old. And so that got me thinking this morning, are you zealous for the Lord and the things that please him? Could that be said of you this morning? Are you zealous for the Lord? Young people, or if you consider yourself young, are you zealous for the Lord? Do you desire to know him, to read his word and to follow him wherever he leads you? Don't let your friends distract you or let others' opinions subdue your zeal that you have for the Lord. I would encourage you, just like Hezekiah did, We've seen him create massive reform that you would stand up and passionately and eagerly desire to do the things that God would have you do. And if someone's to look down upon you and say, oh, uh, a negative comment about you, I'd remind you of the, the words that Paul said to Timothy. He said, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. And now to those of us who might not classify as young anymore, 
Can you say this morning that you are zealous for the Lord? I had this question, are you as zealous for the Lord as when you were first saved? Do you have such a fondness and devotion of the Lord you just want to worship him all day and you want to serve him as best you can in the situation and the circumstances that you find yourself in? To borrow from Paul in Galatians, um, as I see this as a, as a big issue in, in, in a lot of the churches, is that you ran so well. You, when you're first saved, you're all energetic. You're ze zealous for the Lord. But what's happened? What's cut in on you? What has stifled your zealousness, your passion, your fiery fervor, your enthusiasm for the Lord? Have life's pleasures distracted you from the abundance of pleasures that are in heaven for you for eternity? It's a serious issue. Like I said, it's, it's characterized a lot of churches. Their zeal is gone. Whatever it is, whatever it might be for you in your life, I'd encourage you to, to deal with it. Cut it out. Repent of what has stifled your zealousness. Remove it and then seek the things the Lord would have you seek. If you've never known such a high enthusiasm for Christ or never had such a fiery dedication in your heart for him, I'd encourage you to open the scriptures, pray to the Lord and ask that he would set a fire in your heart that would be fanned into a passion that others would see and desire. You know, a zealous Christian can have a huge impact. We've just seen this in the first first few months of Hezekiah's life. He was zealous and it changed the way, the, the outlook from um, the people in Jerusalem, in the kingdom, the southern kingdom. That's a small flame can start a large bushfire. Hezekiah had a huge impact. Consider for a moment that your zeal for the Lord could have an eternal impact on those around you. Our zeal is to be consistent and sincere. It's not just for show. Paul talks about that in Galatians. He said it's good to be zealous in a good thing, a good thing always, and not only when he's present with them. So I encourage us all from this first half of Hezekiah's life or the first portion of scripture that we see of Hezekiah's to be zealous in serving Jesus and telling others of the life-saving power of the gospel, even when no one is watching. Have a zealousness for the Lord like Hezekiah. And as I thought about his life, I think that summed up his first half of his life very well from the, the chapters of scripture uh, that we find. But we know from Hezekiah there's a whole second part of his scripture, a whole second part of his life that deals with the Assyrian invasion. And so this morning I want to have a look at that um, now as well as I think there's uh, some good lessons to learn uh, from that part of scripture. So if you're still in 2 Kings, if we go down to 2 Kings chapter 18 verse 13, we're moving into the Assyrian invasion. So he's reformed uh, uh, the southern kingdom with his uh, religious reforms, which Chronicles really talks about, and now Kings really talks to his political reforms. And in 2 Kings 18 verse 13, he says, In the 14th year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Jerusalem and took them. Oh, sorry, it's fortified cities of Judah and took them. We know from history that he actually took 46 cities. 46 cities he laid siege to and, and took them. I'll just fill in our timeline here. So the Assyrians were the dominant power and Sennacherib was the king. He was the king and he came down, he took these cities and he asks, uh, he asks Hezekiah for tribute or, or some money to basically pay him off. And Hezekiah obliges, probably similar to what his father Ahaz had done. But it's after this that Hezekiah realises he can't keep doing this. And so he fortifies the city. He constructs a new wall for the western part of the city. He stops the springs outside the wall to ensure the Assyrians would not have fresh water when they came to uh, lay siege to them. And he made weapons. He also diverted the waters of the Gihon Spring through a 500 metre tunnel or aqueduct in order to have fresh water inside the city during a siege. And the tunnel 
I believe you can still walk through it today. And funnily enough, it's actually called Hezekiah's Tunnel. 2 Kings 18 verse 17, we'll keep going. Then the king of Assyria sent the Tartan, or, and, or it's, uh, it, I'm reading from the New King James Version, your, your Bibles might have something different, the Tartan, the Rabsaurus, and the Rabshakur from Lachish, with a great army against Jerusalem to, to King Hezekiah. And they went up and they came to Jerusalem. When they had come up, they went and stood by the aqueduct from the upper pool, which was on the highway to the fuller's field. So King Sennacherib now sends his three highest ranking officials to Jerusalem, along with a great army. So the Assyrians now place the city under siege and the chief of staff, or the Rabshakeh, the chief of staff, so the governor, the the highest ranking, I guess you could say, proceeds to taunt, insult and mock the people. Hezekiah had a few spokesmen and they were up on the wall and they, they asked him, please, please speak in Aramaic. Don't speak in Hebrew, please speak in Aramaic so the people don't hear because you'll make them scared. But Rabshakeh yells even louder to produce fear in the people. He continues and he then likens God to those of the idol gods of the countries they have already destroyed and subdued. He boasts against the Lord Almighty. That's a very bad thing to do. Hezekiah was absolutely distraught by this. He's king, he's vastly outnumbered, they're taunting and mocking him, they're mocking God, and so he sends a delegation to the prophet Isaiah. As we saw on that first slide, Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah was a contemporary of Hezekiah. Isaiah responds with these following words in uh, chapter 19 of Kings, verses 6 to 7. You actually find them in Isaiah as well, and it says, Isaiah said to them, Thus you shall say to your master, Thus says the Lord, Do not be afraid of the words which you have heard, with which the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Surely I will send a spirit upon him, and he shall hear a rumour and return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. Isaiah basically says, Don't worry, don't be afraid. God has got this sorted. However, to make matters worse, and this is where the timelines do play a part and why I struggled to get the timeline right, it seems that 14 years into his reign, the Bible tells us 14 years into his reign, Hezekiah falls gravely ill. We read that in one of the, like, deathly ill, he's going to die. Isaiah comes to him and says, set your house in order, you are going to die. So 14 years from his reign takes him to 701 BC. This is the same year Sennacherib is sieging the city. So to paint the picture, Hezekiah is going to die. It means there'd be a change in leadership. And depending on your position regarding co-regencies, which I, this is very interesting with co-regencies, whether a, a younger king would rule with the, the ruling king for a while, it could have meant that Hezekiah at this time didn't have an heir to the throne. We know from the Bible that Manasseh, and you'll study that next week, Manasseh, his son rises to power when he's 12 years old. Hezekiah's still got 15 years to run in his life. So, depending on what you think there, if Hezekiah was, if, if Manasseh wasn't born, the Davidic line would be broken, having huge ramifications for Christ as he was to come from the line of David as he made a covenant with him. And I think this is what led Hezekiah to grieve so greatly and fervently pray when Isaiah said, put your house in order, you're going to die. And as a result of this prayer, God answers Isaiah before he'd even exited the court. I found that pretty amazing. In 2 Kings 20, verses 5 to 6, he says this. Isaiah says to Hezekiah, a word from the Lord, he says, Return and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people, Thus says the Lord, the God of your father, I have heard your prayer, I have seen your tears, surely I will heal you. On the third day you shall go up to the house of the Lord. And I will add to your days 15 years. I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city for my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. Hezekiah, this is an amazing part, Hezekiah has 15 years added to his life. 
Now, we don't have the time to look at this peculiar event today, as it's quite amazing, but other to say, other than, I would just like to say that the psalmist says in Psalm 139, verse 16, he says, And in your book, and in your book they were all written, the days fashioned for me. God has numbered our days. For Hezekiah, he'd numbered his days, and for some reason he decides that, uh, that he needs to tell him that there's another 15 years to run in his life. But for each of us here this morning, God has numbered our days. Hezekiah, just after such an amazing thing, Hezekiah then puts on his best Gideon impersonation and he asks for a sign. God is gracious and he provides an amazing sign in that the shadow of the sun goes back 10 degrees on the sundial. That's pretty amazing. Now with the extra time in the day, it's quite fitting and symbolic actually of the extra time that God has given Hezekiah to live. But moving on, he's come back, he's like, okay, now I've got 15 years more to live. Sennacherib decides he needs to speed things up with Jerusalem. He's still got him under siege. And so he sends Hezekiah a letter that basically says, give up, surrender, give up. This time, Hezekiah, with the letter, goes directly to God. He takes the letter in 2 Kings 19, verse 14, and he went up to the house of the Lord, and he spreads it before the Lord. Once again, Isaiah answers and reassures Hezekiah that God will defend the city and defeat Sennacherib and his army and lead him back to Assyria like an animal. And that's exactly what happened. One night whilst under siege, the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp 185,000 people. As a result, Sennacherib and his army, with their tail between their legs, I'm, I'm assuming, Return to Assyria. He actually outlives Hezekiah and dies in 681 BC. Now, just to finish the story of Hezekiah before we uh, look at one last aspect of his life, just to finish it, we read in verses 12 to 13 of 2 Kings that the king of Babylon heard that Hezekiah had been sick and he sent an envoy or um, ambassadors and presents to him. And when he did, Hezekiah decides to show them all his treasures that he has. But it got me thinking, how, how did the Babylonians hear about this? And I'm only supposing here, and you can research and come talk to me later about it, but the Babylonians were sun worshippers. They understood the sun, and I'm sure they would have noted the time and the day when the sun, or something strange happened with the sun, and the shadow went backwards. The act of Hezekiah may actually have ended up leading and initi initiating the Babylonian visit, which, as we know, uh, Hezekiah um, does something a bit silly. Now, maybe it was the victory over the Assyrians, or maybe it was the fact that he'd been promised another 15 years to live, but Chronicles says at this point, his heart was lifted up. Hezekiah acted with pride toward the Babylonian envoys, and as a result, Isaiah proclaimed in 2 Kings 20, Verse 17 and 18, he says this, Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and all what your fathers have accumulated until this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. And they shall take away some of your sons who will descend from you, whom you will beget, and they shall be eunuchs in the place of the king of Babylon. It was a huge mistake that would result in the destruction of the temple uh, roughly about 114 years um, later. But graciously for Hezekiah, he would not see this wrath in his lifetime. Now Hezekiah goes, he lives, he continues ruling, and he dies in 686 BC. Now that's the life of Hezekiah, as best as I can put it in 15 minutes. But what else can we learn from the life of Hezekiah? We, learn, we know that he was zealous, we, know that, but the, he, we saw that he was zealous, but what else can we learn? And as I thought about it, there was one um, verse that kept popping out at me, and it's found in 2 Kings, I've got it up here actually, found in 2 Kings 18 verse 20. And it's the Rabshakeh, so the chief of staff, that comes and he's yelling to the, the spokesman on the wall and he says this, he says, You speak of having plans and power for war, but they are mere words. But, I, but they are mere words. And in whom do you trust that you rebel against me? During Hezekiah's most trying time, during Hezekiah's time when things looked the bleakest, I guess you could say, 
the, the Assyrian chief of staff yells out, in whom do you trust? And we know from the chief characteristics of Hezekiah, in, that's I've got up there as well, in verse 5 of 18, chapter 18, he says, it says, he trusted in the Lord of God, in the Lord God of Israel like no other. And so I'd like to ask each one of us this morning, in whom do you place your trust? Are you like Hezekiah who placed his trust in the Lord God of Israel? When someone views your life, do they see someone who fully trusts God? When the Sennacherib, when the Sennacheribs or the crises in life come against you in the forms of men or illnesses or financial stress, where do you turn? Do you, do you place your trust in your belongings? Maybe you place your trust in your health and your ability to do something. Or do you place your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ? When you stop to consider, is Christ really my all? And can you say you trust and rely upon him above everything else? And whilst I stand here this morning looking out, knowing that my trust in the Lord has not been exercised to the extent that I know many of you have experienced in your life, I think it's still really important that we each ask ourselves the question this morning, in whom do I trust? Now, do you, did you trust the Lord to get you to church safely this morning or your own ability? I knew this question was coming, so I... I knew that I was conscious of God's hand upon it, upon me coming here, but were you conscious of God's hand as you made your way here this morning? You see, I've been convicted of late, and maybe it's because I knew this message was coming up, but I don't know, that so often I say, Lord, help me with this. And that approach, whilst in some cases may be sincere, may be sincere in many more I know that I take over and I do it in my own strength. I start out saying, Lord, help me, and then for some reason I just start doing it all myself, and then it all turns into a mess, and I go, ah, it's because I haven't trusted the Lord. Do you find that happens to you, or is, is it just me? Jesus said in John 15, verse 5, apart from me, you can do nothing. You can't even breathe your next breath without God allowing you, and yet so often we think we can do things in our own strength, rather than trusting God. I call it the partial dependence on the Lord, which is so, which seems to be so prevalent among many believers today, that the unconscious but nevertheless real attitude that I can of my own self will live the Christian life or do something up to a point after which I need the Lord's help. Unconscious as we may, we think that there is a certain reservoir of goodness or wisdom or spiritual strength within our own character. And this is totally wrong. We should rather actively abide in Christ. When we fully trust him, when we fully realise we need Christ for our every moment, for everything, our prayer becomes, Lord, enable me all day long, for without you, I can do nothing. You know, when we first came to Christ, if you're a believer here this morning, when you first came to Christ, we, we renounced any confidence in ourselves and placed our trust fully in Him as we knew we couldn't obtain our salvation on our own. Now, as we live the Christian life, we should continue to renounce any confidence in ourselves and place it entirely in Christ, a total dependence on Him because we can't do it without Him. And as we do, we'll be transformed and made more like him. So I ask, in whom do you trust? Not just for your salvation, but for your every breath. In whom do you trust? I'd like to finish with a couple stories. Now, many of you might have known John and Christine Skinner. Um, they, used to, they come along to Village Ave. And John passed away last month and he's now with the Lord, but they were two missionaries uh, in Bolivia, in the jungles of Bolivia, actually. And Christine's written down some of her stories in a, in a book. Um, I think a few of you have read it anyway, but uh, she's written down a few of her stories of her life. 
And as I finished reading this book last week, I realised that for John and Christine, it was all about trust. God was teaching them to trust in Him and Him alone. And I just want to read a story right from the beginning of their life when they were just stepping out because I found it quite uh, powerful and, 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 and sort of brings home this point of trusting God. They were, they were still in Australia before they'd left and they, had got, they were running out of money and they were about to head out to church and I'll, we'll pick the story up here. There was how God would work this out and provide for us. Except for our Father in heaven, no one know, knew of our needs. Saturday arrived and we were scratching the bottom of the barrel. 11 cents was left. All they had left in their bank account was 11 cents. It was decision time. There was probably enough fuel in the car to take us the half hour trip to church and return tomorrow. So that bit was settled. Then there was the need for milk, especially for baby Rebecca, who at 10 months was bottle fed. We thought of putting the last of our money in the offering bag at church, but decided to keep one of the coins out. How embarrassing would it have been if it jingled? So unlike the widow who Jesus highly commended in his time, we did not give our last two coins because of our pride. We just put the 10 cent coin in the collection. After church, the Lord pushed our faith a little further. One of, the, one of our friends, Roy, who conducted Sunday school in a little country school a few kilometres out of town, asked John to give a Bible lesson to the children. John had to, quickly think, John had to think quickly to sum up the petrol situation. He accepted the invitation. How we watched that petrol gauge as we travelled what seemed to be a never-ending road to the country school. Now, it was a delight to be there and to participate in the program, but we had to drop our friend Roy home to his dairy farm quite a distance away. That hadn't been factored in to our calculations. We hadn't realised that Roy was coming with us in our car and would need to be dropped home. These were the days before warning beepers in the petrol gauge were standard in cars. How long can a car run after the gauge is showing empty? We thought we were about to find out. However, pleasantly we were, we were surprised to arrive at their place without a hitch. Our friend Roy had no idea that the car was running on empty. Why don't you stay for dinner? It was a kind invitation which we readily accepted. They were wonderful company and Florrie had a great reputation as a cook. She certainly just didn't disappoint that evening. We enjoyed the wonderful country hospitality and were about to leave home when out of the blue, Roy said, bring your car over to the shed, John, and we'll fill her up with petrol. That was so unexpected, it took a moment to sink in. We were seeing God answer our prayers in a remarkable way and it was quite emotional for him. After filling the car with petrol, John, John drove back to the house and we said our goodbyes. Then as we were bundling the kids into the car, Florrie came hurrying out of the house and handed us a large container of fresh dairy milk. The car's tank was full with fuel, the baby's bottle was full with milk, and our hearts were full with praise and thankfulness to the Lord. Trusting in the Lord. John and Christine Skinner, they trusted in the Lord. And I probably have one more time for another story, because this one was uh, as they were heading along the river in the Bolivian jungle. Um, they had a speedboat that would go up and down the river 200 kilometres from uh, the town to where they were staying. And it was quite deserted, quite um, remote. And one day they're heading home at top speed and they weren't so fortunate. They hit a sandbank and they hit it fast and hard. It was stuck. 600 kilos was sitting high and dry on top of the river. It was all hands on deck as John took the shovel and the rest of us used whatever we could find to dig out the sand, but to no avail. We started to unload the car cargo and carry it to a nearby exposed sandbank. We pushed the boat, we shoved it, nothing happened. John started to try the propellers to try and suck out a hole, but it didn't work. We looked around and realised the nearest neighbour would be many kilometres away and we could be stuck here for days. Back then, it was not unusual for a week to pass without seeing a canoe or a boat pass by. So I guess at that point they could say, in whom do they trust? It was then they looked up. Lord, you know our predicament. We need you desperately. We are far from help and are asking you to rescue us from this situation. Please show us what to do or maybe bring someone to help us. Amen. Within minutes, we heard the putt, putt, putt of a motorised canoe in the distance. When it turned the corner, we were gobsmacked. Instead of the usual two or three people, or maybe a little family in the canoe, there were about a half a dozen strong, young, Brazilian men. Apparently, they were heading downriver for a Sunday afternoon game of soccer. 
with their neighbours. When you trust the Lord, he will never, never leave you. He will never disappoint you. And so, as we finish this morning, as we finish looking at Hezekiah's life, a life that the Bible says he trusted the Lord and he was zealous for the Lord, I ask that, is that the same for you this morning? Do people see your zealousness for the Lord? Do people see your trust in the Lord? And by that, do you encourage others? I'd like to finish with the, uh, the last little hymn, of one of John's favourite hymns, and I think this sums it up really good. Like I said, trust was a big thing for John and Christine. And the hymn, you might even know the hymn, How good is the God we adore, our faithful, unchangeable friend, whose love is as great as his power and knows neither measure nor end. Tis Jesus the first and the last, whose spirit shall guide us safe home. We'll praise him for all that is past and trust him for all that's to come. Today, will you trust him for all that's to come? When people are calling out at you, in whom do you trust? Will you trust him for all that's to come? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the life of Hezekiah. We thank you for your word that has described to us his life, his highs, his lows, what he was good at and what his faults were. And Lord, we just thank you for um, that reminder this morning of his zealousness for you and how it is a reminder to us to be zealous for you in the things that please you. So Lord, we ask that you would um, enable us to, to seek out those things that would please you. And Lord, as we do, we commit our future to you. We commit our futures to you. Lord, we trust you with everything and we ask this morning that you would uh, really uh, make that known to our hearts, deep in our hearts, that we would trust you for all that's to come. That no matter what may happen, no matter how empty the fuel tank is, no matter how, uh, how remote and deserted we are, may, where we might find ourselves, that we would look to you and trust you for an answer. Father, may we cling to you at every moment. May you be on our minds all throughout the day. May we have a conscious, remi conscious reminder that we can do nothing without you. May we abide in you all day, every day. Father, we pray this in the name of our Lord and Saviour. It's the Saviour that who died on the cross for us. We pray this in his precious name, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.